So, after a lovely holiday in Greece, I have got back home and I've been working on my keyboard for a while. It's been a little bit since my last update, so I shall talk about where I've got so far because it's quite interesting. Now, I have been working on the firmware and I've deciphered some of the keyboard matrix and I've also managed to get the LCD intermittently working and displaying text. But it's only like 15 characters, so if for debugging purposes I have set up a USB serial connection from the uh, microcontroller to a PC, and it is dumping debug information, and I'll show you what we've got. So what's here is a representation of the keyboard matrix. It's got 17 connections horizontally and 17 vertically, and when I press a key, it tells you that if it energizes line B, it sees that line F is also energized, and of course, vice versa. So, depending which key I press, you get different combinations of letters. All good so far. There's a few little surprises. For example, Shift energizes a whole row. This is actually expected. It means that the shift key is not part of the keyboard matrix. Instead, when you press shift, it just provides power to line H, and H is not used anywhere else on the keyboard. This means that you can uh, use shift with any other combination of keys and not upset the matrix. The other little surprise is the caps lock key, which, as I discovered last time, uh, is handled by logic on the board, but it doesn't have its own caps lock line. Instead, it generates a shift signal. So it's exactly the same to, uh, from the microcontroller's point of view as pressing the shift key, which is not really what I want for a PC keyboard. So I'm actually going to have to rewire the caps lock and shift keys to farm them out to separate signals on the microcontroller board, which is absolutely fine. Uh, I mean, I have lots of spare pins, it's easy enough. Now, the other surprising thing is, if you notice, whenever line P is energized, it gets a signal on line O. And that's odd, that shouldn't be happening. And if you combine that with some other keys, such as six here, this is doing very odd things. Now, I see that when I press the 6 key, uh, when row I is energized, O is energized, and vice versa. But we also get spurious signals on other combinations. And this strange thing here disappears. Now, I think See, other keys do similar odd things. In fact, 6 and 8 both generate the same... Uh, no, they don't. Sorry, I'm getting my I and my J mixed up. Anyway, what I believe is happening here is that there's a short or other electrical misconnection for row P uh, and row O. And this may be my fault, or it may be some weird feature of the board. So I'm actually going to disassemble it and do a bit of tracing and see if I can find out what's going on. So, first thing is to, like, unplug it and take the lid off. So, pull that, and let's stick the tablet somewhere out of the way. Like so, it's not actually a tablet, it's a foldable Chromebook which I love dearly and I've used for years. And let's take the bottom off this thing. So... Phillips screws... Phillips screwdriver... Yep, and... Just remembering I actually have this, it's even got a bit in it. This time I actually remembered before I had worked on half the screws. 
Also, some of the keys are a bit dodgy, and I suspect it could do with a bit of a clean. Now, as I discovered last time, this is the circuitry for handling the shift, uh, the shift lock. I don't know why it's so complicated, but at some point I'm going to remove all of that. There are a lot of screws. Okay, so let's lift this off, let's try and lift this up. How about I unplug the LCD module first? Come on. Oh, I unplugged and replugged this thing so often. Actually, a little aside on the LCD module, I have modified it a bit. The way these LCDs work is you have either four or eight data lines running to the microcontroller, that's uh, these eight tracks here, uh, plus some signal lines. And one of the signal lines is pulsed as a clock every time you send a byte to or from the microcontroller. But for some reason on this thing, there was a resistor capacitor circuit in line with it which made sending pulses rather odd, so I've chopped all that out. So now the line, the signal is just sent directly from the microcontroller, this microcontroller, to this microcontroller, and it works much better. But it's still not always starting up properly when I provide power, which is kind of weird. Still working on that one. Have I done all the screws? Yeah, okay, just a bit sticky. Right. So let's put the lovely and clicky keyboard module aside. And plug in. Okay, it's now working. So here we have the bare keyboard with no actual keys. And here we have a nice conductive metal drill bit. And if I short a couple of these things out, it doesn't really work very well, but you can see that we get a key press. Now we see that the O line is still there, the mysterious O signal. And yes, if I press the six key, we still get the weird thing. So what we need is, actually, I was going to get my voltmeter out. But what we need right now is my new toy, which I need to find. So my new toy, which was a little fiddly to set up due to needing to find somewhere to power it, is this logic probe. And what this will do is I touch this to something, touches my finger, although it's not supposed to work, and it will tell me whether it sees a high voltage, a low voltage, or pulses. So if we touch it to one of these, we see pulses, which we expect because the microcontroller is probing the keyboard matrix. If we touch it to here, we see a low voltage. If we touch it to here, we see a high voltage. 
And we expect this because these are the power feeds to the LCD. So let us work along here and see if we can see so anything odd going on. So expect this to be logic one, that's the power line. We see data, 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 yeah. That's, I think, just a poor signal. Ah, oh, logic zero. That's one of the LCD lines. So logic one. Yep, we don't really expect to see activity on those. Let's try the top. This is ground. Data. Data. And this is getting, yeah, just shorting two pins, which is why I got activity here. Data. And the LCD lines. So I don't see any obviously stuck pins which actually matches what we see on the keyboard matrix. We only get this spurious line when P shows up. And we know there's something wrong with the letter 6. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This one. And you see data of both sides here. If we short them together. Yeah stuff happening. So what we're getting is that when P is energized, O is energized, and I don't know why. Now I need to figure out which is line P because of course all my mappings are arbitrary. It's probably one of these two. Yeah, this is going to be more complicated than I thought because the Yeah, I actually do not believe the log the logic probe is going to help here. What I actually need to do is to disconnect the power, statically determine which line P is, which I've I've got all the tables written down to do so and then do manual continuity tests. Okay, I'm going to have to go and do that. Damn, I was really hoping to find a really useful use for this. I haven't had a chance to use it yet. Okay, time for the paperwork. So here is my pin mapping and I have uh, written down here the microcontroller pin, the letter code used by my firmware, and I should add these have nothing to do with the letters on the keys, they're just arbitrary labels, which I could have numbered but didn't because I had 17 and I wanted a single character each. And this column, which I've just peeped out with the multimeter, is the pins here so that we know that when line O is energized, we get a signal on P. Or possibly the other way around, I have kind of forgotten, but let's try it both ways. So we know that's pin 15 and 17. So uh, they are both odd. So one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15, and 17. This is interesting, they're next to each other. Not getting a thing. Which is interesting. Oh, oh, I've had a thought. 15 and 17, 15, 4, and 15, 3. See, these are on the side of the board down here where there are capacitors. I'm pretty sure that the capacitors are not actually hooked up to anything. I mean, 
I'm pretty sure that the capacitors are not hooked up to those pins. We deliberately skipped some pins. But if those capacitors are actually present, then when the microcontroller probes the board, when the microcontroller probes one line, that could charge the capacitor. And then when it looks at the next line, it sees it energized because the capacitor is still producing power. Yes, how do I test that? I think I use another of my toys. This one I have actually used and I know it works. Uh, it's USB powered, so I need to find a cable. Right, this is a component tester. What it does is it pings the component you connect up to it and it can then identify what the component is. I need a longer USB cable. So if I connect it up to a, for example, a capacitor, and I don't have one at hand, then I push the button and it looks at the component and it will tell me it's a capacitor. And what's more, it will tell me the capacitance. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's trying to test something. It has spotted a capacitor of a peculiar value, probably because it's not hooked up to any things. So if I do that, it says zero ohm resistor. So 15 and 70, eh? 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17. And the question is, can these hooks actually hold? Ah, cursor's lost count. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. Because I need another hand to press the button. No, it's too smooth. Okay, let's see if I can just use multiple hands. It says 800 picofarad capacitor. And it doesn't know what that is. I think this is just spurious noise. Yeah, it's just producing random stuff. It doesn't know what it is. That's a shame. I was hoping it would be able to positively identify a capacitor on those lines. Uh, I might try connecting it to the board. It is suspicious that the two suspect lines are next to each other. Zero, one, two, three, four. Yeah, it's just beating noise. Okay, well. Another of my toys has failed me, so I'm afraid there is nothing for it but to get serious and hook it up to the oscilloscope. The trouble is that I have not found a way to film the oscilloscope yet. So I'm actually just going to do this offline and get back with the results. The oscilloscope will let me see the actual pulse shape. So I'll see a nice square pulse on one uh, pin and hopefully a different pulse than another. Okay. All right, I have a success, or at least an answer.
I'm going to do this by compositing in still photos. So if I look at this pin here, you can see nice clean pulses. There's a little bit of capacitance on the drop off, but that's fine. If I look at, which pin is it? This pin, you see a much longer drop off. That means there's a capacitor somewhere on that pin. Now, I don't actually know whether this is the fault of the microcontroller, which I know has some capacitors, or the keyboard itself. I doubt very much it's the keyboard because why would you put capacitors on a keyboard and cause this exact problem? So what I need to do now, oh yes, this pin is uh, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, which is line P in my matrix. Yes. So what's happening is that P is being energized. Wait, why is it seeing a single on O? I would expect it to be the other way round. You see, I would expect P to be energized, then it becomes de-energized, and then when we scan the next row, which will be Q, I would then expect to see a spurious signal there. Let me do that again. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, 15 and 15 ah 15 is oh right yep not line p yep that's exactly what i would expect o is energized then o is de-energized then we scan p and we still see the remnants of the voltage on line o so we get our spurious signal yeah and i bet all the other spurious signals when we press keys were caused by the keyboard matrix causing O to be energized via another row, which then causes spurious signals thereafter. Okay, so line O is 15.4. So we need to figure out what 15.4 is connected to. Now, I was pretty sure that was nothing. I did go and look all this up. Uh, the board says CMOD. Which sounds like it's got something to do with the uh, capacitive touch thing that all the onboard capacitors are for. You know what? It's probably not worth it. I think I'm just going to move that pin. I've got lots of spares. Particularly as I actually cocked up and I attempted to skip the pins that the debugger and programmer was using and actually I missed one. So if I have the debugger plugged in to the keyboard I get spurious hits everywhere because it's energizing rows. So I think I'll just move that wire and while I'm at it I may as well move the one the debugger's using. So let me use the debugger again and I'll just stick them up here. Uh, yeah so I've still got a long row of unused pins here which will eventually be the shift keys and the caps lock key. I want both shift keys to be independent. That will involve probably cutting tracks. Not scary at all. Uh, okay. So short break while I go and figure out uh, what the relevant pins are, which involves reading the data sheet for the microcontroller board.
Okay, data sheet read. Yes, pin 15.4 does in fact have a 2.2 microfarad capacitor attached to it. And the debugger UART is attached to pins 12.7 and 12.6. In addition, the three pins I skipped here because I thought they had the programmer interface on it, in fact don't. The programmer interface is on some pins over here. So well done me really for all that. So I'm going to move all three wires hopefully to these three pins there. So this is going to be fiddly. 15.4 is this one here. So, I want a bit of tension on the wire. Yeah. We'll have a nice new soldering iron bit, which is not transferring heat. Oh, it's not turned on. An idiot. Yeah, I pressed the switch on the the soldering and power supply, but I didn't actually turn the bus on. Let's wait for that to warm up. Right. Yeah, just because the thermocouple says it's hot doesn't mean the end of the tip is hot yet. There we go. Come on. Melt. Melt, damn you. There we go. That's 15.4. And we want 12.7 and 12.6. Just this one. it is this one. Yeah, these are the built-in USB UART on the programmer board. So they were being held high or low. Well, I hope that was what the problem was. But yeah, these are definitely the wrong, in the wrong pins. These Cypress boards are great, but the documentation does kind of assume that you're working on a, an industrial design and not on the development board with all the built-in hardware. So actually finding what the built-in hardware is, is sometimes not as obvious as it could be. Uh, these go in here. Come on. Why is that not working? Uh, right, <laughs> I don't want to put those in the, in those holes. Those are the holes they came out of. I want to put them in down here. Tell you what, I will actually. Solder 15.4 before it falls out. This is going to be another of one of my amazingly competent soldering joints. If you've actually been watching any of this, you can probably tell why this didn't work first time. That 
That's one of my less awful joints, actually. I just hope it was in the right wire. And that goes in there. Come on. Everything is awkward. Yeah, I. This entire project has so far been a catalogue of errors. It's not even particularly complicated, but soldering the wires onto the board on the wrong side has made things so much more complicated. Okay, 04 and 03. Ah, they're springy. I can't. Uh, can't take my finger off them, so I'm going to have to use I'm to try and lightly tack them down. Okay. But they are going to spring out as soon as I melt those joints again. And I'm going to do this poorly. Try this. And he's still on the camera, so. Looks like a joint, not a very good one, but it's a joint. It does not look like a joint. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So we've moved 15.4 and we've moved 12.7 and 12.6. So the next thing I want to do is to beat them out and figure out where they've moved to. I know it's like 1011 and 1, uh, 1011 and 1. I know it's uh, these three pins, but I want to get them in the right order. It was two. Uh, I can't even remember where I put them in now. I just look for the wires that don't that don't fit these three. Uh, o two, o three, and o four. So. O2 is now okay, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. Good. And so, uh, what was on pin 15, which is this one, is now on 0 0.2. Twelve point seven and twelve point six. These are pins. These were on uh, fourteen and sixteen. So that will be on. Let's try what's on O three. Uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen. Fourteen is now on O three. This one. And that means that 16, which was on 12.6, must be on 04. But let's check it because of some old parable about donkeys. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Yes. Good. Right. So that is the board rewired. The next thing is to go and update the firmware and reprogram it, which is also going to happen offline. And the computer says, complete cock up. 
Yes, well, you can tell I do this late at night when I'm tired and not tracking terribly well, because it turns out that uh, those three pins I soldered the three wires to were not the pins that I thought the debugger was on and aren't. They were, in fact, the pins that I was completely correct about avoiding, because these were the pins that had the capacitors on them. And the result, I've just hooked it up to three capacitor loaded wires, producing three tracks like this. And I'm going to have to do it again, because that was just wrong. So that was awesome and a highly useful waste of time. So let's turn the soldering iron back on again. Yeah, it is now 5 to 11. And I want to get this done tonight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the three wires. And I can tell which ones they are because I have them written down on a piece of paper. Somewhere. Be right back. Written down on a piece of paper. 03, 04 and 02. And I'm going to move them to uh, 33, 32 and 31, which are hopefully actually unoccupied. <sighs> Fantastic. Right, well, at least the wires are obvious. And the soldering iron is actually hot, so let's just take them off. One. See, if I keep doing this, eventually the end of the wire will fatigue and snap, and then I will have to strip it again. And you know how much I like wire stripping. Still, the main reason for recording all this, apart from demonstrating to the global public just how or just how bad I am at doing this, is as a video diary of what I've actually done hardware-wise. The software is easy. The software's got a version control system. I can look back and find out exactly what I did. But the hardware, I need a record. So what happened to my other wire? should be a stray wire somewhere. Where's it gone? What will have happened is this is sprung back to roughly where it was, so I can't see the end anymore. There it is. They actually turn out to be right next to each other in ribbon cable. Go figure. That's actually moderately convenient. So it's these three. I hope that was those three. O two, 2 3 or 4 Yeah, it matches my paper. All right, so let's push them through to the other side. And we're going to use three, 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 two, three, one. Let's just take them in order. And so this one goes in two. Come on, three, one. Followed by Sold a blob on the end of that wire. I hope it'll go through the hole. No, it won't go through the hole. And this one. Okay. Sold a joint time.
Right. Again, not bad. Beeper time. Where are they now? So it's these three here. See three, three, two, three, one. So three, three is either fourteen, is fourteen, sixteen, or fifteen. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen. One of these. Hello. That's actually put a decent amount of flux on the joints, which, so they're not necessarily making good contact. Uh, interesting. This is two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. That's three, one. Sides so that must be fifteen. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen. Yep. Which means that the remaining one is pin fourteen, which must be on three three. Just this one. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. Yep. Okay. Right. So now, once again, I have finished the board. So once again, I have written down what the new uh, written down what the new pin assignments are, so once again I need to go back and reprogram the firmware. Be right back. Good news everyone, pin 3.2 has a capacitor on it. I cannot believe this has gone on so long. The, uh, the data sheet for the microcontroller is desperately hard to read. There is no single list of what all the pins do. So what I'm doing is I'm actually reading the circuit diagram schematic. But again, there is no single line from the pin on the microcontroller output to where the circuitry is. It's all neatly divided up into little boxes with no linkage between them. So the only way to figure out whether a component's attached to anything is to go look at every single one of the boxes and see whether it's associated with a pin. So, uh, that's not good. It's a really lousy piece of design. Uh, so I'm going to have to move that wire. Well, there's one pin next to it, which is 3-2, that's uh, 3 zero, so I'm going to put it on there. Oh, good grief. This is ridiculous. At least I didn't bother to turn the soldering iron off that time. Okay. Uh, pin three two is undone. Then I insert it into the hole. Uh, no, I don't because there's a solder blob on the end. Still don't. Yeah, that wire's not seen better days. 
try that. Uh, no, let's try the actual hole. Yeah, there we go. There's enough tension to make it stick. Solder. Wait for the smoke to dissipate. Ah, that lovely smell of flux. All the carcinogens that, that you know are really good for you. Looks like a sensible joint. Once again, the board is finished. Again. You know the drill. Be right back. And finally, finally it works. We have a nice blank keyboard matrix and when I short out pins we get a nice clean pair of tracers. So, well that was a bit of a disaster. So I'm now going to reassemble the damn thing. There's, this is actually literally all the electronics I need to do. I now have enough to actually turn it into a functioning keyboard and I even have the code somewhere. So all I really need to do is to map the keyboard matrix and I'm done. Uh, you can, it would be nice to be able to identify the, the row lines from the column lines because it makes a slightly more efficient sampling, but it's, I, I really don't think it's going to be worth it. I might as well just scan the whole lot. Okay. Um, and I'm also, I'm going to have to take this apart again to, to give it a proper clean. Some of the keys are dodgy, as I mentioned. The return key is a bit dodgy. Backspace a bit more. Yeah, there's actually fluff on the pads. That's not going to help. Uh, can I do that now, actually? Probably. Pull out a cotton bud and just... Very likely. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to need more than this. I don't want to have to. Yeah, and I suspect I'm actually adding more fluff. There's a few hairs. All right, well, it's actually late, so I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to put it all back together and plug it in again. Right, finally turn the soldering iron off. Because I'm going to have to take it apart again anyway to deal with the shift keys. I'm actually slightly running out of pins on the board. The good news is that uh, the the shift keys being modifiers are just simple switches. So you press the key and it makes a connection from live to the pin. There is no keyboard matrix, which means there's no scanning required. So I could actually use one of the pins with a capacitor on it and that would not be a problem. I think I've got enough pins, I don't need to worry about this. The keyboard is used up 17. The LCD has used up uh, 8 plus 3 is 11. And we've had to blacklist 
at four for the capacitors and another two for the debug UART. So that's 17 plus 11 is 28, plus the five blacklisted ones is 33. So I think the thing's got about 40 GPIO pins. So it should be okay. But this is why uh, some keyboards use discrete counters, uh, not counters, uh, multiplexers, so that you can send, you can wire the multiplexer up to four pins and send a binary code from zero to 16. And then the extra logic will actually take care of energizing one of the sense wires. It means you need far fewer uh, GPIO pins on the microcontroller itself. Of course, once I'm done with the wiring and the electronic side of things, I then need to try and find a box to put it in. That'll be completely bodged together. I'm Okay, so let's put that away. And I will set it up with the computer again. Okay, so it's all hooked up and I can press keys. And you can see nice coherent pairs, all the keys. So I just need to write them down, come up with a mapping table. Just make sure there are no horrible, no more horrible surprises. I'm sure there will be horrible surprises. Yeah, that, the backspace is feeling much better now. Shift is still on H. Code is another one. Uh, my eventual, uh, let me just make sure you can see code. Code is down here. Eventually I want to use code as a modifier key uh, because this has no like cursor keys or anything. I'm not gonna bother with these. So, and the way I've done this in the past is use code as a modifier and then use WASD. Uh, but this is not a rolloverable keyboard, really. So, yeah. So D, the D key, um, is B and M on the keyboard matrix. Code is B and Q. When I press them both at once, this actually connects Q and M via B, so we get spurious key presses. So that ain't going to work. Uh, so I'm going to have to unwire code from the keyboard matrix and wire it directly up to the microcontroller as a modifier key. Yeah, repeat works, space works, and relock works. I'd also kind of like. Uh, at least repeat to be a modifier. Relock I will probably end up using as a compose key so that I can type international characters. Uh, but yeah, that is actually now working, which is very, very nice. So the next, yeah. Or it occurs to me one thing you can do to prevent rollover issues is to wire up diodes to the keys. I suspect I'm not going to be able to do that simply because the way the uh, the key switches are not soldered to the board, they're just like 
printed on the PCB and then these rubber pads make contact. So modifying the board is going to be hard. So there's no real place to put diodes. Plus I don't understand how they work. The layout is weird. But yeah, the next video is probably going to be me mangling the board and hopefully not breaking it beyond all recognition because I need to deal with caps lock, shift, other shift, code and repeat. So that's one, two, three, four, five modifiers. I could use a sixth wire for the caps lock light. I'm not really sure what I'll do with it, but I might as well like wire it up. So, oh yeah, there's also one wire already used for a modifier, which is H here. So I need to find an extra five GPIO pins on the microcontroller. I think I can manage that, though I'll need to check carefully. Anyway, wow, this was a performance. Thank you for watching. If anyone still is, please let me know what you think in the comments. And now I think I'm going to go to bed.